Welcome everybody, thank you for coming to my channel once again. This is Minkoi, welcome to Minkoi's bedroom. Today we'll be watching a new video called Why was the German army so effective in uh, the Second World War? Now this is a video that I just discovered like literally 10 minutes ago. It was just interesting and I was just about to watch it myself. But uh, I told myself, well, why not just make a video of it? And uh, yeah, that's all what I'm about to do. So uh, let's do it. After the end of the Great War, and after an unsatisfactory peace, huge inflation, and an unprecedented economic crisis, Germany was on its knees. Germany was still a country with huge economic potential due to the factories and companies that still existed there. Germany was... It's insane how much smaller Germany is nowadays. You know, they lost all the territory to the East. Like, most of it. Like... I can't point it with the finger, you know, because you won't be able to see, but, oh, with the mouse. They lost basically, basically what Germany is right now is this. Basically, they lost all of this. And even more so here in the First World However, War, which is only insane. only shadow of the former monarchy. Yeah, look. But, from 1933 to 1941, Germany achieved what it had not realized in the previous war. It had a new army that was considered unstoppable, acting with precision, speed, and communication, taking by surprise the great European powers. Thus, at the end of 1941, almost all of Europe was controlled by Germany and its allies. It's insane. German soldiers could see the building. It's insane how much, how such a small country, in retrospective compared to the United States, in terms of land mass, was able to achieve what it did. I, I'm not trying to glorify it or anything, it's just thinking about it's insane. ...of Moscow from a distance. Almost yeah. all predictions led to a total German victory. But how did this all happen? Was it just the efficiency of the German army? Or was it a multitude of reasons, including sound planning or even luck? The end of World War There's a lot of brought about a time of chaos for the Germans, and what the rest of Europe. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of luck, especially initially before they even uh, annexed Austria, because Austria was initially um, it was initially defended through a pact by Italy. Uh, so before 19 uh, before the Pact of Steel and the eventual alliance between Italy and Germany. Uh, Germany tried to annex Austria earlier, but uh, was basically cowered, uh, or at least put it into place by Italy, because believe it or not, Italy uh, was initially a very strong power compared to Germany. Germany just bloomed in terms of uh, military might within a very short uh, sp uh, span time. Europe likely believed would prevent a near future containing a powerful German military. They were wrong. The ability of Germany to rebuild its military might generally came with the rise of the Third Reich. But before this rise was a fall brought about by the events of the Weimar Republic. Yeah. After the end of the First World War, Kaiser Wilhelm II became the target of intense backlash and pressure from both the general public and his own military. On November 9th, 19... Which is a little bit hypocritical because in the beginning in 1914, before the, the First World War started, everybody in the country, in, uh, in Germany, or at least... I don't want to generalize, but a, a large uh, swath of the population was for the war. And when the war was uh, eventually declared, I mean, there, were, there was a party uh, initiated by the masses uh, because they, were, they, they didn't know, first of all, what they were getting into. But even as the years went on, you know, let's just say that the psychological uh, uh, map of the country was very pro-war in the beginning of 1914. Wilhelm was and forced then, to abdicate and a provisional government made up of members of the Social Democratic Party and the Independent Social Democratic Party of Germany 
was established in his place the following day. By spring, the Weimar Republic had been formed with Frederick Ebert as the first president. Shortly into Ebert's term, the Treaty of Versailles was signed, reducing the German military to a mere 100,000 men. Furthermore, Germany was compelled to take responsibility for World War I, paying hefty reparations and giving up some of its territorial possessions. This treaty was a huge blow to the newly established Weimar Republic and was quickly followed by a new obstacle, this time in the form of hyperinflation and the Great Depression. That's this just insane. Turmoil Look, for many working class that's Germans, just... and the moments in which Adolf Hitler and his party suddenly became okay. a beacon of hope. With a building concern that the Weimar Republic could soon be overrun by the communists, the German people turned to this new alternative, which quickly became the largest political party in parliament by 19... I mean, in my opinion, if you were gonna do the Versailles Treaty, which was a mistake, by the way, I mean, it's easy to say it now, you know, in retrospective, but uh, if you were gonna do it, you might have as, uh, as well have just just made it as destructible as possible because what they ended up doing was they inflicted a very heavy and very serious blow to the german empire um but it wasn't a uh, uh, it wasn't a blow that would finish the empire it was just a very heavy blow in my personal opinion if you were going to go for it you, you, this should have just went for the harm side they should have taken the rest of the territory here, just giving it to Poland, and just compact. I mean, it wasn't really feasible. But it, towards the end of 1918, I don't know if if the, if the terms were even more humiliating. What the effects would have been? Would they have been way too humiliating to the point where Germany could never recover, or what? The consequences of it would, would have been, but they basically half-assed it, in my, in my opinion. 1932. The following year, Adolf Hitler was elected as the new Chancellor of Germany. Which is so interesting how he came to be... Uh, oh, 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 shit. I think he, he jumped like a the dickie. The first few Never weeks mind. of his term were hugely influential and brought about a drastic shift in Germany's projected rebuilding. Yeah. The new chancellor and his party had a plan, as could be anticipated from his speeches and from his book. It had to start from the inside, and the new party tried to consolidate its power through propaganda and normative acts. Then the rebuilding of the army had to begin, ignoring the Treaty of Versailles, with the next phase being to annex the German-speaking territories through diplomacy, influence, or military intervention. Which... Nice. Like, annexing Austria was one thing, because uh, Austria at the time was already a, a fascist government. Uh, it wasn't a government aligned with the Nazi party or uh, the Italian party, where they were a little bit subservient in a way to, or at least dependent uh, upon the, the Italians, but they were not uh, Nazi, uh, uh, they were fascist, but they were not of the Nazi variety, so to speak. And uh, annexing them Annexing Austria was one thing, but then what not only Germany did to Czechoslovakia, but what the, the West did, and not only the West, but uh, in many ways the Soviet Union, because Czechoslovakia had a pact that, uh, well, there was a pact that basically guaranteed it, it, its independence from, uh, from uh, basically, if you attacked it, the signatories of the pact would defend it. It was a, an agreement that, uh, and there was a loophole actually, that the Soviet Union signed the pact. They said that if Czechoslovakia was attacked, they would join and defend Czechoslovakia if uh, France uh, declared war. So if France left at the chance of protecting Czechoslovakia, the Soviet Union would have declared war on Germany and Germany would have been done. But they, like everybody just let the most for the white part of Czechoslovakia just just go. While with increased production and a larger army, the focus was to be on defeating their biggest rival in the region, France. Yeah. First, Article 48 was invoked, 
which largely reduced the progress that had been made on the grounds of civil rights and put a strong lid on the Communist Party. Yeah. Next, Hitler established the Enabling Act, which gave him the ultimate authority to pass any law he wished without the approval of the president or parliament. <laughs> One of the main goals was now aimed at bringing back Germany's prior military might and building upon it. One of the new... I don't know what year is this. Is that 1933 yet? Because did he mention the Reichstag fire, or is Chancellor's he gonna overlook the it? Most famous changes to the armed forces was the establishment of the Wehrmacht. This was the unified military of the Third Reich, beginning in 1935, and was made up of land, marine, and air forces. The new military might was much larger than the Treaty of Versailles had allowed and brought about a radical increase in defense spending and the reinstatement of conscription. The Chancellor had solidified his self-proclaimed role as the ultimate authority over the armed forces and required every commander to now be at the beck and call of his orders. In spite of internal opposition and skepticism from some of the commanders, the army was able to reoccupy the Rhineland, a yeah. very industrialized region. That was a very heavy, uh, that was a huge um, gamble, so to speak, because the, the, there were fortifications uh, in the Rhineland, or, no, there were not yet, not, not yet, uh, but the army of France was so much larger. In this stage, it was 1936, the French army in 1936 was so much larger than the German one, and uh, the gamble was enormous. And when the French uh, backed down, so to speak, because it gave them a, a casus belli to attack Germany by uh, uh, militarizing the Rhineland, they could have went to war for it, but they didn't. Um, and it was a huge uh, achievement in Hitler's uh, sort of approval rating because he did the impossible, you know, because it was a huge blight, you know, because. Uh, the Rhineland was uh, occupied for a long time by French forces uh, that were there with, you know, like a whole army was uh, in the Rhineland and he just took it. Region that was vital for the army wasn't there anymore, by the way, just for the future war machine. The annexation of Austria, the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia strengthened the German economy and yeah. the production lines. The goal of the Allies was appeasement. And all those within the Wehrmacht who had questioned the Chancellor had been proven wrong thus far. The overall approval rating from the German people concerning the new regime had vastly skyrocketed, and any opposition was essentially silenced. The handful of generals and troops who had been on the fence about the new Chancellor were now willing to back his plans for war after his territorial successes, and with a fully equipped and prepared military, Germany was ready to invade Poland with an already building momentum. The goal, beyond wanting to regain territory that had been lost from the Treaty of Versailles and expand further, was to avoid a long war at all costs. To accommodate this lofty aim, the Germans adopted a new military tactic known as the Blitzkrieg, or Lightning War. This wasn't a completely new form of warfare. The strategy that Germany followed had much in common with the strategy that existed in the first war when the idea was the same, to defeat its enemies quickly and decisively, as the country was ill-suited yeah. to win a long and drawn-out conflict against larger, better-prepared forces. The German army had the benefit of new military technology, that included better and more rapid tanks, motor vehicles, aircraft, and radios. These new tools, combined with an emphasis on the element of surprise, speed, mobility, focused attacks, and at the end, encirclements, enabled the army to turn traditional military tactics into a devastatingly modern brand of warfare. Not only did the Blitzkrieg tactic sound good in theory, but it also genuinely worked. 
The Germans utilized this new strategy when they invaded Poland and subsequently set off World War II, and then again when they faced off with enemy lines from Denmark, Norway, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, France, Yugoslavia, and even Greece throughout the first two years of the war. The Blitzkrieg... It's funny how the, the flags of the Netherlands, Luxembourg, France, and Yugoslavia resemble each other so much. I mean, you can just flip them. Was an extremely and profitable the risk of the same flag. Has played a hugely significant role in Germany's immediate success. The Ardennes. This strategy course. worked to quickly disorganize and throw off the enemy troops by using a narrow line or formation of concentrated offensive forces to break through enemy lines. The Germans would first locate a weak point in their opponent's defenses to create a breach, permitting armored tank divisions to penetrate rapidly and roam freely behind enemy lines, causing shock and disorganization among the enemy defenses. As their counterparts struggled to reorganize the front line and prepare new lines of defense, the Air Force prevented additional help from reaching their adversary and sending reinforcements to seal breaches on the front. As the gap widened, the flow of German troops would continue to rapidly file through that area, and a focus would be put on preventing the enemy from refilling the gap that had been created. The tanks were followed by motorized divisions who formed solid flanks protecting the military convoys. In the middle, the corridor was supplied continuously with more and more equipment and soldiers. By doing this, the enemy didn't have much time to react, as more piercing movements were created at the same time in different spots. Eventually, any enemy troops who were unable to fall back or escape... It's insane how much logistics is involved in war, because... You know when you play video games you think all oh, you think you take five tanks and you go conquer the world right but the amount of food so the supply line is so vital first of all and so massive when you research it I mean there's so much going on that needs to be continuously supplied throughout the whole army it's in time it's insane. would be encircled by the Germans. This made it easy for the latter to now seize a dominant role in the battle and compel their opponent to surrender. This tactic worked quite well against the French, who were shocked by the speed of the German army and their attack through the Ardennes forest. After France was conquered, the main goals were achieved, and the Soviet Union seemed to be the last chapter of their conquest and domination of Europe. On June 22nd, 1941, Operation was launched with the goal of occupying the western portion of the Soviet Union. At first, the German Lightning War was severely damaging to the Russians. The latter was pushed back towards the gates of Moscow as their attackers were yet again carrying out an aggressively strong assault. The situation was made worse for the Soviets. What's really insane about uh, everything is that uh, how far they went from Germany proper here to Moscow, like all the progress they did in uh, in uh, the uh, the Eastern Front, all happened within one year, give or take. Like 1941, all that happened in 1941, mostly. 1942 as well, especially in the Caucasus. Since Joseph Stalin had initially a hard time believing that the attack was going to happen, even after receiving intel that a German attack might happen. By the time the Russians had realized the true gravity of the danger they were in, the Germans had already gained the upper hand thanks to their lightning war strategy. Within a single week, German forces advanced 200 miles into Soviet territory, destroying nearly 4,000 aircraft and taking out of action around 600,000 Red Army troops. That's insane, As man. Before, the In a week? Combined with the element of surprise worked and would prove deadly for a medium-sized country as the land surface would allow the German army to move fast, to conquer the important cities, and to force the other country into surrender within a few weeks. Against the Soviet Union, the situation 
was different. Yeah. After I mean, three winter months man. of warfare, the Blitzkrieg tactic was no longer the deciding factor for a German success. It had worked at the start of the conflict, but now the situation had changed. It would be more interesting if you put the important cities on the map, because I, I'm pretty sure that uh, where the, the uh, O is, right now that's Moscow, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Mainly due to the huge size of the USSR, the winter, and the better defense lines created by the Soviets. The counterattack of the Soviets was well thought out and executed, but it also proved triumphant since the Germans had been fighting longer than they had anticipated on a huge front. They lost the element of surprise and momentum, and they... The amount of casualties when you research the Eastern Front is just insane. It's a number of people you can't really uh, visualize. You know, it's like, I think it's 7 million. I might be wrong, 7, 8 million for the Germans and like 27 for the, for the Red Army. They were fighting against a more populated country with high capabilities of production, which was also aided by other allies. And from that point on, the war turned against the Germans. The reason behind why the German army was so effective in World War II is a combination of many factors. The plan and fanaticism of a party to dominate a continent, the process of rearmament and war material production, and the expansion against Austria and Czechoslovakia, which was not followed by major reactions, combined with the preparation yeah. of invasions against other countries, created the scenario for this efficiency to happen. Additionally, the work that had been done to rebuild the German military might, despite the constraints of the Treaty of Versailles and the execution of the Lightning War strategy by competent officers, consolidated with the mistakes of their counterparts, proved to be an almost unstoppable combination. Although Germany lost the war, its initial success can be attributed to a multitude of factors, and we can talk about them more in detail in some future videos. In this one, we try to oversimplify for you the major agents that led to the effectiveness of the German army in the Second World War. So make sure you subscribe to our history channel and press the bell button for more animated World War II. Go subscribe guys, this is Knowledge, Knowledge yeah. it's very nice, it's a very good channel. I just discovered it actually, so my thoughts on this, um, first of all, great video. Uh, the only little caveat is if he could have put, uh, then again, it's not a, a video about the, the Eastern Front, so he just, you know, if it would have been interesting if he just put the capitals so that we could have had a sort of an understanding of how far uh, yeah, the, the army advanced going east. But other than that, the video was very good. It, uh, it showcased a lot of uh, a lot of the, the reasons why Germany was so effective uh, in conquering uh, Europe at the time. And initially, one of my biggest pet peeves when uh, reading about the Second World War for me was uh, the utter sort of dismissal of uh, Czechoslovakia in 1938, when uh, all the other powers, you know, with the, with the Treaty of uh, Munich, where Czechoslovakia was basically, Czechoslovakia wasn't even invited to defend itself. Basically the major powers, uh, uh, France and Britain, negotiated a peace with Germany that said you won't go further than what you were allowed uh, if you get the Soviet land. And uh, Czechoslovakia was basically betrayed by its allies, um, or at least by its protectors, uh, which was a hugely, huge mistake because the border of Czechoslovakia was heavily defended, uh, heavily defendable, and uh, because it was uh, uh, a border that was, uh, especially the the German border, uh, was uh, mostly mountains, and uh, it could have, the defense would have been brutal, and the cost for taking Czechoslovakia would have been enormous for the Germans. Uh, and actually, Czechoslovakia was further betrayed by Hungary and Poland. Um, uh, they attacked Czechoslovakia when it, uh, basically what happened was 
the Sudeten then was given, but then uh, uh, Hitler wanted just uh, the rest of uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, he ended up, you know, uh, having making a deal with uh, Slovakia Patriots, uh, and they became independent. They became a puppet state, basically, and Czechos uh, Czechia was destroyed. But anyways, I, I hope you liked this video, and it was very, very in entertaining. Uh, and yeah, I hope you're gonna come back for more. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.